SEP Fanfic Readings presents Aurelian by Biddy Blue Eyes. Chapter 17 Reacquainted, or Acquainted at Last. Oh, Hermione, you're back already, Mrs. Weasley said in a surprise when Hermione gave a little knock and let herself into the burrow. Yeah, we're finished for today, Hermione answered. She made her way to the kitchen where Molly was cleaning the table and Ginny was perusing the sports section of the Daily Prophet. Harry? Ginny asked as she folded up the paper. He's okay now. We've made a plan. So he's not going into... No, he's not going into Nocturne Alley, Hermione reassured her. Thank you, Ginny said ardently. I know he can probably handle himself, but I don't think anyone should go there, but most certainly not him. I know, said Hermione. She knew how hard all of it was for Ginny to accept. Harry rarely told her much of what he did at work for that very reason. She worried for him. She knew her friend would worry for her, too, if she knew that Hermione would be going to Nocturne Alley in his place, so she thought it better not to mention it. So where's Aurelian? Oh, I'm sorry, dear, we didn't think you'd be back so soon. He just went up to the orchard with Charlie to try out his toy broomstick, Molly apologized. Ginny, why don't you go get him for Hermione? No, no, don't worry about it. He can play for a little while, said Hermione. Well, you're welcome to go watch them if you want, Molly offered. No, definitely not. I would ruin all of the fun with my worrying. I still have a hard time seeing Ginny and the guys pulling some of the tricks they do. I might have a heart attack watching Aurelian on one, Hermione chuckled nervously. It's only a toy broom, Ginny reminded to assuage some of Hermione's fears. They fly low. His toes will barely be off the ground. I know. I'll just let him have fun with Charlie and tell me about it later. I bet Charlie's having as much fun as Aurelian, Molly smiled. When I told him that Aurelian had a toy broom that he hadn't tried out yet, he was thrilled to take him up there. I hope you don't mind, Hermione. It seems her family has adopted him as a nephew, Ginny chuckled. It's good for him, Hermione replied. It really means a lot. He means a lot to us too, love, Molly told her. It's been quite some time since we've had little ones around here. Now we get both Raylian and Teddy to liven the place up a bit. So are you coming to dinner here tonight? Harry is bringing Teddy again, Ginny informed her. Oh, I'm not going to be able to make it tonight, Hermione replied apologetically. Hey, Jen, since Aurelian's going to be playing for a bit, do you think I could steal you away to talk? Ginny and Molly looked up at Hermione with interest and she blushed, making the two women even more curious. Sure, let's go, Ginny answered. She pushed out of her chair and started for the stairs. Hermione followed after and glanced back at Mrs. Weasley. The woman wore a warm and knowing smile which caused Hermione to blush more deeply. There was no way a veteran mother like her did not recognize the signs of boy-girl issues. So. Ginny asked, plopping down on her bed. He's coming to dinner again, Hermione declared, her stomach twisting in knots. Okay, Ginny said uncertainly. I don't see why you're so nervous, though. You said things went rather well on Friday. It was a bit awkward, but it should be a little easier this time. Yes, it did go well. While we're on that, you still haven't told Harry or Ron, have you? Hermione asked. No, I haven't, but I still don't understand why you're afraid to admit it to them. I think Harry's actually hoping that you will give Malfoy a chance with Aurelian. I think he feels a bit bad for the guy, really. Yes, but tonight... Tonight isn't just about Aurelian. I... I invited him over as a date, Hermione hurriedly admitted. She closed her eyes and bit her lip, feeling incredibly self-conscious. Ginny's eyes widened in surprise. Really? Hermione nodded and felt quite silly about how she was acting about the whole thing. Unfortunately, feeling foolish about her insecurities did nothing to quell them. Jenny, I'm so nervous, she blurted. I've never asked a guy out before. Well, with the exception of Ron, and that was an awkward catastrophe. That's understandable, though. You and Ron had been best friends for several years then, grown up together. You were already very close. It's hard to change that into something else, Jenny reasoned. Yes, but Draco and I severely disliked each other for those same years, Hermione reminded her. Yes, but you've both grown up since then. You're not children anymore. You have the ability to see each other for who you really are now, Jenny said supportively. And Draco, is it now? Hermione blushed. She didn't know when it happened, but she had started referring to Malfoy by his first name. I just... I don't know what to do. It is so weird between us. I don't know what to expect. I don't know what to say or do. Whoa, whoa, calm down, Jenny urged. First, are you sure he knows it's a date? I mean, are you sure he doesn't think it's just to see Aurelian? He kissed me, Hermione blurted out. What? Ginny gasped. Her eyes were wide with openly gaped at her friend in shock. When? Where? 
yesterday at my flat when we got back from taking Ari shopping. He just kissed me, Hermione said, worrying her lip once more. Wow, that's great. But I mean, where on on the lips, Hermione interrupted. Wow, that's rather unexpected, Ginny chuckled. Unexpected for you? I was stunned dumb. I couldn't say anything. And then I didn't think he was coming to the meeting last night. And he left right after, and okay, okay, Ginny said, trying to slow Hermione down again. So neither of you were really prepared for that, but it's not a bad thing. You know he's interested now, and he's even coming over for dinner tonight. Oh, Ginny, I can't do this, Hermione whimpered. This isn't like a normal date. He's been feeling the same way I have about the memories, and about... Stop, Ginny ordered. You're getting yourself too worked up about this. This is different because you both are looking way too far ahead at what you could possibly have. Don't. You're looking at a large picture, seeing potential love and potential catastrophe. Don't. If you look too far ahead, then you'll trip up with what's right in front of you. Just go with it. Think optimistically and just go with it. See where tonight takes you, and then you can start planning for the next time you see him. If you plan any further than a day ahead, then you're going too fast. The two people you saw in that pensive had a lot that they experienced before they got where they were. I know, I know that, Hermione told her seriously. But that's much easier said than done. I feel like I've already seen so much of him. I feel like he has expectations for me, and I'm not sure that I'll reach them. And that's you looking too hard again. Just focus on having a nice dinner tonight, Ginny insisted. Speaking of, what are you wearing tonight? Well, I'm certainly not going to be casual as I was the last time. I want to look nice without being fancy. I was just thinking about one of my sundresses. One of my nicer sundresses, Hermione added quietly with a blush. Good. That sounds perfect. You want to feel comfortable, but also a bit sexy, Ginny said simply. Hermione's eyes widened when she heard the word sexy. Ginny laughed aloud at her friend's look of panic. Feeling sexy isn't for his benefit. Feeling sexy or pretty makes you feel more confident and therefore more comfortable, Ginny explained. Now, hair? Makeup? I don't know about my hair, but I think simple with makeup. I rarely wear any, so I don't want to, I don't know, just something light and very natural, I think, Hermione answered, looking for approval. Ginny hadn't had much to do impressing since school, as she and Harry found themselves in a very comfortable and stable relationship, but Ginny loved playing fashion and dress up with her friends. The whole conversation was thrilling, and she looked as if she was having a hard time containing it. Good. That's perfect for you. You wouldn't want to do anything that doesn't fit you and your personality. And hair... Hmm. Ginny looked at her for a moment. You want to be you. Naturally you. I say, grab some Sleek Easy's hair potion and give it a little run-through. Not much. Just let it bring down a bit of the frizziness and let the natural curl still take over. Hermione nodded, gratefully accepting Ginny's tips. By the way, what are you planning on making for dinner? Ginny asked. Something pretty simple, as I really don't know his taste. Nor Aurelian's, for that matter. I thought maybe a salad and pasta with a vodka cream sauce? She asked. Sounds fantastic. Dessert or no? Always, Hermione smiled. Chocolate mousse? It's easy, but delicious. You're making me wish I was coming, Jenny chuckled. See, this will be great. Just a nice, relaxing dinner. I hope so. Mummy, Aurelian started. Is it? No, Aurelian. It is not 6.30 yet, Hermione smiled. He'll be here when it is, and you will know. You just have to be patient. Okay, Aurelian pouted. Hermione reached down and habitually combed his hair into place with her fingers. I know it's tough to wait, but it's not too much longer. I'm going to ask you to stay out of the kitchen, though. It's hot in here, and I don't want you to get hurt, Hermione requested. Aurelian nodded, but held on to his little pout. Instead of going into the living room, however, he walked over to the other part of the kitchen and sat down at the table. The table was already set and looked almost exactly the same as it did last time, complete with a fresh arrangement of dandelions. In addition, Hermione had already placed wine glasses on the table for both herself and Draco. She wasn't sure he'd be bringing wine again, but she had a perfect bottle that she'd purchased to complement the meal. Daddy bringing me another present? Aurelian asked. I don't know, and I don't want you asking him. He just brought you a lot yesterday, she reminded him. But I like presents. Ah! Hermione shrieked. Aurelian looked up and laughed. Aurelian, please go get your troll off the kitchen floor. Him likes cooking, he told her, not understanding the problem. Well, why don't you take him to the table and he can pretend to cook with you? I almost stepped on him. Hermione took a deep breath to calm herself. Aurelian was the sweetest child she had ever the pleasure of knowing, 
but little things like that were still frustrating and she was trying to get used to it. Aurelian hopped off his chair and crawled across the floor to get his troll figurine, which was beating one of the cupboard doors with its club. Just as he reached for it, the chime from the fireplace sounded through the flat. Daddy! Aurelian cried. He crawled under Hermione, almost knocking her over, and scrambled into the living room. Hermione took another steadying breath, and when her frustration with the interruptions in the kitchen melted away, she was filled again with the incredible anxiety of having Draco over as a date. She set the salad bowl on the counter, removed her apron, smoothed out her dress, and walked into the living room. Hi, Draco greeted her. Aurelian wrapped around his legs again. Hi, she smiled shyly. You look nice, he stated timidly. He looked her over quickly and looked down at Aurelian, hoping not to appear as though he were trying to avert his gaze. She had surprised him a bit. He knew this dinner wouldn't be quite as casual as the last time, but he hadn't seen Hermione dress up in any way since the Yule Ball nearly six years prior. He had seen her in sundresses for two days and appreciated that she looked nice in them, but this one was different somehow. It was a little more fitted, and the solid white color, lacking in decoration, urged him to see her, rather than his vision being drawn by busy prints and beads. Her hair was as wild as ever, but hung in bouncy, satiny curls that framed her face. It was then that Draco realized that he had somehow ended up staring at her, despite his efforts. Thank you, Hermione blushed. Present, Eddie? You bring me presents? Raelian asked, looking at the cloth bag in Draco's hand. No, actually, it's another bottle of wine for your mother, he said a little guiltily. He removed the bottle from the bag and handed it to Hermione. I hope it fits all right. Not quite with our dinner tonight, but I have a bottle. I can use this for next time. Her blush deepened when she realized that she had inadvertently revealed that she hoped they would be another dinner together. If Draco noticed, he didn't show it. His attention had returned to Aurelian. I did bring you something, though. I thought that since I was bringing a fancy drink for your mother and me, I could bring one for you, too. Do you like Grubel's fizzy soda? He asked, taking out a bottle of lime green colored soda. I do, I do! Aurelian exclaimed excitedly. He reached up for the soda and jumped up and down gleefully when he received it. I have pretty cup, too? Yes, I think you can have a fancy glass also, Hermione agreed. I'm still preparing dinner, so I thought you boys might like to play a little. Sure, said Draco. We color? You color with me, Daddy? Aurelian asked. If that's okay, he said, looking up at Hermione for permission. Yes, but we have a rule that coloring must be done at the table. Is that all right? She asked. As long as we're not in your way. No, it's fine. Aurelian, you know where the crayons and coloring books are. And make sure you remember to keep your coloring on the paper, she reminded him sternly. Just the evening before, when talking with Harry before the meeting, Aurelian had taken his crayons away from the table and started coloring the walls. She was quite mortified by it, but Harry just laughed. Creature had been happy to have something to do. Okay, Mommy, Aurelian agreed a little too quickly. He took hold of Draco's hand and started to drag him into the kitchen. Hermione casually snatched the glass beverage bottle out of Aurelian's hand as they passed and followed them into the kitchen. Only a couple minutes later, Draco and Aurelian were hunched over coloring books at the table. Hermione chuckled. She had never imagined she would see Draco Malfoy quietly and contentedly coloring with crayons. Returning her attention to dinner preparation, she took up her spoon and donned her vintage frilled penny. She glanced over her shoulder at Draco, feeling a little self-conscious in her apron. She shook the thought, though, determined not to show her feelings to be based on Draco's approval. What should he care, anyway? It appeared that he didn't. He still hadn't looked up from his or Aurelian's coloring books. She dropped the dried linguine into the boiling water and started rinsing a few raspberries to top the chocolate mousse. Despite his efforts to concentrate on Aurelian and his coloring book, Draco couldn't seem to stop peering over at Hermione every few seconds. There were only a few times in his life that he had actually watched someone cook. He had grown up with the service of house elves and really took for granted how the prepared food ended up on his plate. It looked like there was quite a bit to it, but Hermione flitted around the small kitchen with ease. She was in her element and floated gracefully from one task to the next. He loved the adorable pensive look she wore when she tasted the sauce. Only after a second's pause she seemed to know exactly what she would add to improve the flavor, because when she tasted it next, she looked quite satisfied. She was such an intriguing creature, and he couldn't stop glancing at her. Daddy! No purple hair, Aurelian admonished, bringing Draco back to his task. He looked down and noticed that he had accidentally picked up a purple crown instead of brown. The witch he'd been coloring had quite vivid violet hair. And why not? he asked, making as he had done it on purpose. It's silly, Aurelian giggled. Is it sillier than green skin? he asked, picking up the green crayon and coloring the witch's face with it. 
Aurelian burst into hysterical giggles. Or a pink broom? He smiled, quickly coloring the broom's handle. More, Daddy, Aurelian insisted. With blue spots, he added spots to the broom. Orange, orange hands, Daddy, Aurelian requested. Hermione looked away from her cooking and laughed at the sight of them. She still couldn't believe how good Draco was with Ari. It was almost like he was still a kid himself. That, too, was something she had never imagined. Draco Malfoy is a toddler. She wondered what he had been like. All right, guys, it's time to put the crayons away because dinner's ready, Hermione announced. Mummy, mummy, look what Daddy drew. He color her funny. Aurelian giggled behind his hand, holding up the picture for his mother to see. He certainly did, Hermione smiled. I put it on icebox? He asked. Sure. Put it on the icebox? Draco asked curiously. Um, yes. It's a tradition to hang children's artwork and award certificates on the icebox with magnets. Just a simple way to display them. I didn't realize that it was strictly a muggle thing, she mused. Well, it might not be. I've never seen our icebox. The kitchen in our home is set apart where only the house elves go, Draco explained. Hermione nodded. She was rather surprised to find that she wasn't as upset at the mention of house elves this time. Can I help with anything? Draco offered. I think I have it, although you could pour Aurelian's drink if you don't mind. Of course. Draco moved all of the place settings back into place while Aurelian put the coloring books away, and then he poured the green soda into Aurelian's small wine glass. Aurelian looked positively giddy at the sight of it. Hermione brought the dishes to the table and offered for Draco to help himself while she began to pour the wine. This time, she remembered to place the bottle away from the busy tot. What this? Aurelian asked, looking at the pasta on his plate. Draco was sort of glad his son had asked. It was obviously some sort of pasta, but he wasn't sure what kind of sauce it was. It's linguine with vodka cream sauce, Hermione told him. I can't like that, Ari said with a sneer at his plate. Of course you can. It's spaghetti, Hermione said, putting it in terms he understood. Oh, he said brightly, digging his fork enthusiastically into the nest of pasta. Hermione rolled her eyes and Draco chuckled. Hermione took a bite herself and secretly watched Draco to see if he liked it. She really wasn't sure if he was a picky eater, but she assumed most people like pasta with the tomato sauce. She relaxed when she saw he enjoyed it. So, Draco started. Potter said he was meeting with Weasley this afternoon. He was supposed to have met with Bill. Yeah, Hermione replied. Bill works for Gringotts, and they're working together to see if they might be able to secretly have a look at records connected to the Parkinson's. If they're being threatened, it might be for money, or supplies, or some kind. Either way, they would probably need to make large withdrawals, and we're hoping, if that's true, that we can find a pattern, or a flaw in the pattern of withdrawals. The problem lies in getting the goblins to allow us to have a look. They are very serious about client privacy. While that's appreciated, we wish they would relax about it when the Ministry makes inquiries for legal investigations. Bill said that it might be better to try to butter the goblins up without mentioning the Ministry first, as they might protest even more if they know the Ministry is involved. They don't much care for the Ministry involvement. Yeah, they don't much care for wizards in general. I think one of the only reasons they tolerate us is because of the hold they have over us in the banking system. Draco agreed. About the Parkinson's, I spoke with Blaze last night and mentioned my concern about Pansy and her family, being rather vague. It turns out that he knows that I'm working with you and Potter on something, but I told him it was confidential. He agreed to keep an eye out for me. He'll let me know if he notices anything. That's great. And Harry did speak with Kingsley today. The case is officially confidential now, Hermione informed him. Enough about that, though. I like your policy of no work at the table. Well, I kind of agree with that. I have to admit, I'm rather curious about your work in international magical cooperation. What about it? he asked curiously. Well, I've worked with you a few times for international crimes, but I know that's just extremely rare for you to deal with. I guess I'm just curious about what you do, and how did you ever get into it? Well, I actually became sort of interested around the time of the World Cup when I was 14. Seeing everyone from so many backgrounds, I realized I didn't know much outside my own life. Then Bovatan and Dernstrang came to the school, and I felt even smaller, he explained. The war ended, and I was able to take my NEWTs after only two months of study, and did rather well. I still didn't know what I wanted to do. When I was looking through my options, that one stood out. It mentioned that traveling would be required, and that sealed it for me. Do you travel often, then? she asked. Depends on what you call often. I tend to travel about once or twice a month, but it's usually only for two or three days at a time, Draco told her. It's usually paperwork, compromises, and deals. I'm sent in as representation of our department. Just a messenger, really. You say that like it's a small position, but it's rather impressive how high up you are only two years after joining the department, 
Hermione said seriously. Thank you, Draco said, surprised and flattered by her comment. What kind of places have you visited? What's been your favorite? I've traveled quite a bit, really, mostly just around Europe. I've gone to the United States once. I also went to Singapore and Japan. Japan was definitely my favorite experience. Depending on when we finish all of this, I might get to go back soon. Japan is to host the final of the next Quidditch World Cup, so we've got a lot of talks to have with them. The next World Cup is still a little over two years away, Hermione said incredulously. And they started talks about it two days after the last one, Draco chuckled. We've been in contact with the other hosting countries, too. But as the final games get so much attention, there's a lot to go over about security, transportation, language barriers, proper dress. You know, this is all terribly boring. We can't be interested in this. I am, though, Hermione insisted. I certainly haven't seen much of other wizarding cultures, and I think it's rather fascinating. Really? Draco asked a little skeptically. He caught the look on her face and realized that she meant it. Yes. So what makes Japan your favorite so far? She asked. Well, it really is different. I think a lot of people have the image of the traditional Japan in their mind. And it's there, but there's so much more, he said excitedly. Hermione smiled at the fire of passion in his eyes. Much of the older generation of wizards still dress and perform tasks in traditional Japanese fashion, the ancient way. But much of the younger generation was a little more modern. On the whole, most people seem rather extroverted compared to us. They weren't really at all shy to come up and try to talk to me. Many of them even touched my hair because they found the color so different. Hermione laughed. Teddy hair different, said Aurelian, trying to keep up with the adult conversation. Yes, it is, isn't it? Hermione smiled. That had to be rather uncomfortable for you, huh? She asked Draco. Yes, very disconcerting. I got over it, though. I realize that they just don't have the same social boundaries as we do. But they also have tighter social boundaries in other aspects. They have manners and mannerisms that are expected that would seem rather formal here. It's just commonplace there. The coolest thing there. Draco started out sounding extremely excited, but then became very unsure of himself and just stopped. No, go on, Hermione urged. Well, he said, working his courage back up. He found all of it very fascinating, but he really didn't know if anyone else that did. His mother politely listened, and Blaze laughed at him. He shared some of it with a guy he worked with, but as that man had been there much longer than Draco had, it wasn't as thrilling to share. Hermione seemed interested, but he was afraid he would appear silly and childish with his enthusiasm. Really? I'm dying to know what you were going to say, Hermione pressed. Me too, said Aurelian, having no idea what was being discussed. He picked up a piece of pasta with his fingers, set it on his fork, and brought the noodle to his mouth before slurping it in. Well, Draco continued a little more calmly, they don't use the flu network in Japan. They have something they call kutai monko. They take a crystal-like powder that feels like sand and sprinkle a line of it in front of a doorway. They speak where they want to go, open the door, and then walk into that doorway. It can be used at any door, but only opens to the specific door named. For example, if I were to use it here, I would address it just like I would the flu, but it would go to your front door and not, say, your bathroom door. But also, they're not rude. Every home has a foyer, so when someone enters, it's not directly into their house. That's really neat. It must be rather convenient, too. You could use it so easily leave a muggle home or anywhere with a door, instead of only a fireplace connected to the flu network, said Hermione. Yeah, I thought so, too, at first. I wonder why we didn't choose something like that for national transportation. Until? she asked. Until I realized just how easy it was to make a mistake. See, when one can use it on any door, there's always the other side of that door. They use a special knock on the door to allow the person on the other side to know not to use that door because it's being used for travel. Well, no one told me that. I heard someone knock on the door, and I opened it. I ended up traveling from Kyoto to Tokyo, having absolutely no idea what happened. Draco chuckled. Hermione had to cover her mouth and hope not to choke on her dinner as she giggled. Yeah, and whoever was originally going to travel didn't realize it or something, because no one came looking for me, he continued. I quite surprised the family I popped in on. Luckily, their teenage daughter spoke a tad of English. She was able to tell me how to get back. That's hilarious. It must have been nerve-wracking at the time, but what an adventure, Hermione chuckled silently. You really make it sound incredible. You've made me want to visit there now. Me too, Raelian repeated. What about you? What drew you to work in magical law enforcement? Draco asked. The war. At first, I told myself that I never wanted to do that kind of thing again, that someone else could go do the tracking and investigating and such, because I was done. Well, like you, I studied for my NEWTs for a couple months while Ron and Harry jumped right into aura business, 
skipping most of training because of desperate need of help in that area. After I took my NEWTs, I saw how torn apart the world really was and how badly the law enforcement department was suffering. I decided I couldn't just say that someone else should do it, because that's what everyone was saying. I just had to do it. Once I got into it, though, it wasn't bad. I found my place in evidence, examining and filing. I still go to crime scenes, but most are, well, they're not serious crimes. Extreme violence and murders were more rare when I came in, and I've stayed that way. Luckily. It became like playing with puzzles, trying to make everything fit. You said Ron went into being an aura right away. How did he change to the magical law enforcement squad? Drago asked. It just didn't feel right to him. He thought it would be more exciting. When it turned out that they did have a lot more tracking on paper than in the field, he started looking at the MLE squad. And I don't know where it came from, maybe a combination of Quidditch skills and chess skills, but Ron's a really good strategist. He fits in well there. I really think it's good for him to be separate from Harry, too. He's lived in the shadow of his brothers and then Harry his whole life. Working as an aura with him would have meant he'd feel like he'd never find a place to stand in his own light. He's good where he is. He's valued for who he is, and I think he's great for him. And I'm babbling terribly. Merlin, I am sorry, Hermione apologized. It's okay, Mummy, Aurelian said, patting her hand consolingly. Hermione chuckled at him. Thank you, Ari. He's right, though you may have started babbling. We forgive you, Draco smirked. Hermione started blushing. She was supposed to be talking about herself, not Ron. Well, why don't you bring us back to the topic by telling me what you like to do when you're not working? Hermione suggested. Um, all right, he said. Well, I really like Quidditch still, but as I said before, I haven't been to a game in months. Blaze and I hang out after work sometimes, but we mostly sit around chatting. I'm really rather a boring person, I suppose. Do, do you date often? She asked timidly. No, not really. I've dated a couple of girls, but only for a few weeks. The last few months, the only dating I've done was bringing someone with me to social engagements, and those have all been for charity events. I've tried to persuade my mother to allow us to attend the charity events as just the two of us, as we're already going together, but she insists that it's not proper. She says it's fine that she go without a date considering my father... Well, she insists that I must bring my own date with me. I think she does it because she's worried that I'm not actively seeking a relationship like she thinks I should. Sounds like my friends, said Hermione. Oh, that's just my mother. Blaze and Pansy are far worse than she is, Draco chortled. What about you? Do you date often? Um, no. Not at all, actually, Hermione admitted, blushing furiously. What about you and Weasley? Uh, Ron, Draco asked. You seemed, um... No, Hermione said hurriedly. She laughed and continued. No, no, nothing like that. We're just friends. We tried once, just one date, and it was so awkward. We decided mutually that there just could not be anything between us. Draco nodded. He wouldn't let her see it, but he was quite relieved. The way she talked about Ron a few minutes before, so fondly, had concerned him a bit. All right, then, since you chose the topic, what kind of things do you like to do when you're not working? He asked. Well, I enjoy unwinding by watching some television sometimes, Hermione offered. Me too, Aurelian said excitedly. I like Fireman Sam. Fireman Sam and the Teletubbies. You like them too, Daddy? Um, I don't know, Draco said uncertainly. I've never watched television before. We watch it? We watch it now, Mommy? I show him Teletubbies, Aurelian pleaded. We're eating dinner right now. We'll see how we feel after that, she answered evasively. You watch it with me, Daddy? Watch it after dinner? Aurelian asked hopefully. Draco glanced at Hermione, not knowing what to say. She glanced at Aurelian, and when she saw that he wasn't looking at her, she shook her head no to Draco. He could see that she was doing it for him and was even more curious to know what it was, but he decided to take her advice. I'm not sure about tonight, but we might be able to play a little something before you go to bed. I see that your troll was out. Yeah, we could play my troll, Aurelian said excitedly. You have to finish your dinner, though, Hermione reminded him. So, you were saying, Draco prompted. Oh, right. Well, I'm rather a boring person myself, I suppose. As everyone seems to remember about me, I like to read, she offered. That's a very broad statement. What do you like to read? Draco inquired. Well, recently I've taken to magazines. I subscribe to Popular Potions, and I really find it fascinating. But it only comes out every three months. I just started a subscription to Witch Weekly a couple months ago. I used to scoff at it when I was in school, but they have some really good recipes and useful spells and tips for keeping house. But magazines get finished too quickly. I'm really a person who enjoys novels, muggle or wizards. I enjoy both. I'm currently reading Agatha Noel's Werewolf Tragedy series. Really? And what do you think? He asked curiously. I'm really enjoying them. 
I only discovered them about a month ago, she said. Which one are you on? I'm a little more than halfway through the third book. Why? Have you read them? Yeah, it's my favorite series. Not that any reach the spot is my favorite book, but certainly my favorite series. Have you read the fourth? That's the most recent, isn't it? Hermione asked excitedly. Yeah, it's fantastic. I can't believe that in the end she... Don't! Hermione shrieked. Aurelian jumped in his seat and Draco burst out in a hearty laugh. Hermione narrowed her eyes at him, uncertain of what to make of his reaction. I'm sorry, he apologized, trying hard to school himself back into a calm state. Hermione still looked at him warily, but started to relax a bit when she saw the wide, genuine smile he wore. I wasn't going to say anything. I couldn't help myself. I just wanted a reaction. Pansy did the same thing when I did it to her, although you must be a little more restrained than she is, as I'm not wearing your wine. Hermione had settled, but she still couldn't bring herself to smile. She felt uncomfortable in a different way then. She and Draco Malfoy were not only carrying on a civilized conversation. He had had joked with her, no cruelty involved just played with her to get a laugh. It was just like something Harry or Ron would pull. She realized that she was beginning to become comfortable around him, and it seemed so comfortable that it would become uncomfortable. Only, did he see it like that, or just her? I'm sorry, he said once more, his smile beginning to fade when it didn't look like his joke had been accepted well. No, it's okay, Hermione said, putting on what she hoped was a convincing smile. You just really played with my emotions there for a second. Apparently, I'm a little more serious about books than I should be. I like books, said Aurelian. I like Hopping Pot. That's right. I got to read that to you the other night, didn't I? Draco said with a smile, realizing that they had left the little person out of the conversation. He asked, So, tell me, Aurelian, what did you do today? Hermione stood and began to clear away the dinner plates. I went with Mummy to see Helen, and... What was the grumpy guy's name, Mummy? Aurelian asked casually. Hermione stopped mid-step, the cup of chocolate mousse frozen in her hand a few inches above the table. She shook herself and placed it down in front of Aurelian. You can call him Grandad, and do you think you could try to call Helen Grandmom? Okay, he smiled. We went to see Helen, um, Grandmom and Grandad today. Draco looked up at Hermione. She had avoided looking at him when she set the dessert down in front of him. She looked so hurt and injured that he wanted to say something, but he didn't know what he could offer. And she gave me a lots of eggs and a muffin to take to Aunt Molly's, Aurelian continued cheerfully. Did you have fun there again? Draco asked him, still keeping his eyes on Hermione. Yep. Charlie helped me fly on my broom today. I went so fast, he shouted, standing up in his chair with his arms in the air. Charlie chased me everywhere, all around. I was too fast. Sounds like a brilliant time, Draco said with a smile at the enthusiastic tyke. Uh-huh. I went zoom, zoom, zoom. Run right into the tree, he laughed. What? Hermione asked suddenly. Yeah, huh? I got an owie on my knee and broke the broom, but Charlie made it all better, Aurelian assured her. Hermione did not look comforted. He's fine, Draco told her. Look at him. It hasn't deterred him at all, so he didn't really get hurt. And those brooms really aren't fast. If he says it was broken, it was probably just a tiny slap twig. It's nothing to worry about, I promise you, he assured her. When I was his age, I thought I was king of the world on my toy broom. But I also thought I was the fastest runner in the world. Don't worry about him. You take me flying, Daddy? You play with me and a broom? Aurelian asked. I'd like that. We'll have to see, though, Draco told him, uncertain when and where he'd have the chance. All right, Hermione said, standing again. Looks like we finished dessert. Do you two want to go play a bit before bed, or... Yeah, we'll play, Draco told her. He enjoyed their conversation at dinner but he felt quite guilty that Aurelian had been so left out. Yay! Aurelian cried, rushing off to the living room. Draco smirked and followed after. Hermione spent the next ten minutes cleaning up the dinner plates and the kitchen counters. She wanted to give the boys some more time to play privately. When she was through, she walked into the living room and sat on the sofa, handing another glass of wine to Draco, who nodded in appreciation. He was again sitting on the floor, with Aurelian with several figurines in front of them. They had two trolls and a handful of witch and wizard figurines. Hermione was personally unfamiliar with the figures, but the way Draco had explained them to her, they were fictional characters that were much like Muggle's superheroes. She was amazed, even more than before, when she saw the way Draco played with Aurelian. Quidditch was something that most adults could appreciate, but there he was making voices and grunts for the troll and wizard as he was in charge of. At one point, she had to stifle a giggle. Draco had seen her, though, and sneered playfully. You know, Aurelian, I think your mummy should get down here and play, too. What do you think? Draco suggested with a sly smirk. 
If she could laugh at him for playing, then he thought they should be on level ground. Yeah, mummy, Aurelian said excitedly. Sorry, guys, not this time. A rain check, though, Hermione replied. Oh, come on, Draco goaded. You're not afraid of a little old troll, are you? Of course not. Just after playing with the real thing, how can toys compare? She said playfully. Oh, that's right, Draco said, the memory returning to him. It was you that found that troll in our first year. No, it found me, Hermione corrected. Huh, he laughed. That seems like so long ago. Well, it was, wasn't it? Well, sort of. It's been ten years. But those ten years have really flown by. Daddy, Aurelian grumbled, upset that his father's attention had been stolen away. I'm sorry, Hermione apologized, but actually it's about time we get you into bed anyway. Aww, Aurelian whined. No bed. Hey, you don't tell your mother no, Draco admonished gently. Good men mind their mothers. Hermione looked at him with a soft smile, surprised by him once again. It was nice to have his support, but what was even more significant was his use of the word men. It was one thing to say good little boys, but he had said good men. It spoke louder somehow. It included him when he said it. It felt more like a suggestion on how to live instead of just how to act. Hopping pot? Hopping pot, daddy, he pleaded. Draco looked at Hermione, seeking her permission. She smiled, nodded, and summoned the book for them. Okay, said Draco, but when I finish this, you go to bed with no more fuss, right? Right, Aurelian agreed, climbing into Draco's lap. When the story was finished, Hermione excused herself and Aurelian so that she could put him in bed. Please, mummy, please, my song, Aurelian begged as Hermione pulled his pajama shirt over his head. I'm sorry, but your father is out there waiting, Hermione apologized. Please, 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 mummy, he pleaded. Hermione sighed, pushed his hair off his forehead, and stared into his silvery eyes. She smirked and shook her head. He was simply impossible to say no to. All right, get under the blankets and close your eyes. Aurelian quickly did as he was told, and Hermione turned out the light. She sat down on the edge of the bed and rubbed his back as she sang. Good night, my love. The tired moon is descending. Good night, my love. My moment with you is now ending. It was so heavenly holding you close to me. It will be heavenly to hold you again in a dream. The stars above have promised to meet us tomorrow. Till then, my love, how dreary the new day will seem. So for the present, dear, we'll have to part. Sleep tight, my love. Good night, my love. Remember that you're my sweetheart. When the song was finished, she leaned forward and placed a kiss on his forehead. Good night, Aurelian. Hermione opened the door and gasped to see Draco standing there. Sorry, he apologized quickly. I mean, I didn't mean to startle you. I just had to use the toilet, and when I came out, I heard you singing. I was pretty nosy, I guess. No, no, it's fine. I was just startled is all, Hermione told him. Regardless of what she said, she was embarrassed to know that he had been overheard. So, what song was that? Draco asked as they both walked back into the living room. Oh, it's something he asked me to sing. I guess I used to sing it to him most every night. It's an old muggle song by Ella Fitzgerald. My dad used to sing it to me, she finished quietly. Draco looked at her sadly. He didn't know what had happened at her parents' house that day, but he knew it hadn't gone well. He wanted to ask, but knew that if she wanted to talk about it, she would. He didn't want to pry. It was too personal. It's a nice song, Draco commented. Yeah, I really don't do it justice, though, Hermione said bashfully. I think you sing quite nicely. Hermione blushed deeply. Well, um, thank you. I still don't do it justice, though. It's big band music, so the instruments are a large part of it. Big band? Draco asked. Yeah, jazz music, Hermione told him as she sat on the sofa. Sorry, I forget that wizards don't have as many music styles. What do you mean? Well, there are a lot of different genres in muggle music. Here, there's basically music like Celestina Warblack or the Weird Sisters, Hermione explained. Tell me then, what other kinds of music is there? Draco asked. Oh, tons, Hermione replied. Way more than I could mention. There's jazz, classic rock, punk rock, rap, techno, pop, then ethnic styles like salsa and reggae. There's so many. Hermione stopped and her excitement faded. Sorry. What? Draco asked, looking rather confused. I'm sure you're not really that interested in hearing about muggle things that I have a tendency to go on and on about. Hermione admitted apologetically. No, it's okay, said Draco. Really? She asked skeptically. I mean, you've always seemed... Against all things muggle, he offered. Yeah, well, I was always taught that there was one right way to be, 
one right way to do things, I guess. Over the years, I started wondering about how other people did things. I started working for the International Magical Cooperation, and I started traveling and seeing all different kinds of people with a lot of different backgrounds and traditions. I thought, well, they can't all be wrong. I guess, well, muggles might be the same kind of way. I don't think they're wrong, just different. Really? Hermione asked. It meant so much to her that she didn't know what to say or do. She was overwhelmed. It's still really different. I still don't really know much about it. It's a strange culture. As soon as he said it, he quickly added, But that's not a bad thing. Just a bit intimidating. I know. I had a lot to learn when I entered the wizarding world. Do you miss it? Living in the muggle world? Draco wondered. Um, no, she admitted truthfully. I never really left it. Well, that's how I see it. We're in the muggle world right now. I'm sure you've seen that I still hold on to some muggle things. I have electric lights and television. I listen to muggle music and still wear many muggle clothes. I use more magical things than muggle, but I think I've learned to live in both worlds quite well. You might have to show me that television thing sometime, Draco said, looking a bit flustered. All muggle-borns and even some fascinated wizards talk about it. And why did you want me to say no to Aurelian? Because the show he wanted you to watch is hardly tolerable. It's a very annoying children's program that must have been thought up when someone was taking psychotropic drugs. Draco laughed at Hermione's vehement distaste. I wasn't about to let that be your first impression of television. No, if you're actually interested, I'll put in a film or something sometime. Yeah, I think I'd like to see what it is, he agreed. You know, if you ever have a question about a muggle thing, you can ask. But if I ever start going on about them and it's a bit much, you can also ask me to tone it down. I won't be offended. Ron gets quite fed up with Harry and me going on about stuff sometimes, Hermione told him. Draco nodded. They sat in silence for a few moments before Draco stood. Well, I guess I should probably go. Hermione stood and nodded. Yeah, I guess... I mean, you don't have to, she said suddenly. I mean, I'm not making you. I just... She blushed deeply. She couldn't seem to be able to verbalize what she meant. I understand, he told her. Thank you, again, for dinner. It was really nice. Very good. I really enjoyed talking to you. I enjoyed it too, she smiled. She was starting to get uncomfortable once more. They stood rather close to one another again, and she couldn't stop thinking about the kiss he had given her the day before. She could not decide if she wanted him to do it again. She thought she rather wanted him to, but she just didn't know. He looked both curious and anxious as he reached down and took her hand in his. He didn't fully understand his action. He had just realized that he had never really touched her before. Her hands looked so small and delicate, her fingers so dainty. He ran his thumb over his soft skin of her knuckles, and his eyes returned to her face. She looked nervous not frightened, as she had the day before. He smiled. It was a start. I'm going to kiss your cheek, he told her. She nodded dumbly, and her eyes closed slowly, so many delicious feelings flooding her, as his lips alighted on the soft rosy cheek. Thank you, he said. Hermione's eyes fluttered open. She wasn't sure whether he was thanking her again for the meal or for the kiss, but she wasn't sure what to answer to either. Thank you, she returned. I... I'll see you tomorrow. Draco nodded. Good night. 